Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to be sharing the workshop that I hosted for Entrepreneurs Organization Toronto, where I share my customer experience, employee engagement, and company culture strategies. I hope you enjoy it. Awesome, uh, Jeremy, thank you, and EO, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know your time's very valuable, and uh, thank you so much for selecting our venue uh, to host this event. Uh, I know you guys said uh, you guys aren't going to be doing any recruiting, but I'm going to teach you about recruiting tactics today. So maybe you guys will use some of those on the people you're trying to recruit. But uh, so you heard it here first. Um, I've spoken to three EO chapters before, um, New York, uh, Boston, and Victoria. So I know the, the community really well. I love speaking to entrepreneurs because you guys get it. And we probably have the same challenges that we're trying to overcome. Uh, our services and our products are different. Uh, you know, I sell steak and wine and vodka, and you guys sell consulting services and different products and um, you know, marketing services. At the end of the day, and, and I don't want this to sound like a platitude, but at the end of the day, we're all in the people business. How do we leverage our people, our customers, and our employees to grow profitable businesses? Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today. I'm gonna share what's working for us and what I've been you know, experimenting with uh, for the past decade, um, starting back to my time at 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Uh, Ten years ago, I was a call center agent there. And uh, I'll tell you kind of some uh, the backstory on that and, and why it's relevant uh, and the value that I learned there and how I'm applying that today, uh, again, from a different industry. Um, so things such as customer experience, employee engagement, and company culture, that's, you know, I know a bit about marketing, I know a bit about sales and PR, but it, my thing, if you will, is customer experience, employee engagement, and company culture. That is what I've decided I'm going to use to build businesses. Um, this is one of them. Uh, borrow, as you saw um, on the tour, many different layers. We have five different P&Ls in this building, right? Like it's five different businesses. There's many different areas, different people, different, different uh, personalities. Like it, it's it's like a little hotel is the way that I describe it. It's not your typical restaurant. Uh, the loft is just one aspect to this building. Uh, I didn't want to do a keynote with the slide deck with some like motivational quotes. Uh, I'm not that guy uh, at all. Uh, if, you know, I need to be motivated to get out of the bed in the morning. So if you're looking for motivation, probably not the right guy to talk to you about that. But I'm a tactics guy. I like to share what is working for me. Um, I would never tell you uh, strategies that don't work. I just like tried and true. So that's what I'm going to share with you guys. And uh, as I'm describing them, y yes, it's relevant to hospitality. But like I mentioned, we're all in the people business. Just if you can take away one, two, three, five different things, uh, then great. And put your own spin on it. Um, Cameron Harold is somebody you may be familiar with. He's the former COO of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. He taught me very early on in my career, in my early 20s, that R&D doesn't have to stand for research and development. It can stand for rip off and duplicate. So if you learn something here, just go. Like in a, a month or a quarter or whatever, and you're like, hey, that thing that you said works, works for me. I, like, I love getting those emails. That's, that's really what drives me as an entrepreneur is just like, let me do the, sh the, the crappy part, like figuring out if it works, and then I'll give it to you guys. And, and then maybe if there's stuff that works for you, send it back my way, and, and hopefully they'll work for me as well too. Um, a bit about me, uh, like I mentioned, I started my career in my early 20s. I left business school because I'm not an academic at all, um, as much as my parents wish they probably that I was at the time. So I left to join 1-800-GOD-JONK as a call center agent. Spent six years there, moved up every single year, was promoted six times in six years, I uh, dedicated my career in my 20s when my friends were at nightclubs, you know, buying balls of goose that they couldn't afford. I was reading case studies. Um, so I sacrificed my 20s to be able to develop a career that I really wanted. And, and I think I've, you know, got there, uh, but I'm, I'm not done. Um, I left to start what I thought was going to be the biggest consulting agency in the world focused on customer experience, employee engagement, and company culture. It started off in my parents' kitchen table. My headquarters telephone number was my cell phone. I would answer the phone being like, thank you for calling Falcon Consulting Group. I thought it was going to be like multiple people, never got more than one. Um, Jeremy speaking. Oh, can I speak to Michelle? One moment, please. Hey, Michelle speaking. Like, just, I, I, like, 
<laughs> that's how, you know, I, I was a bit of a liar. Like, let's call it what it was. Um, <laughs> so, but then I got, like, contacted by Verizon Wireless, and then I was like, what the hell? Like, $100 billion? They don't know that my mom's, like, making my lunch for me right now? Like, it, it was humble beginnings. Like, so then the clients got bigger and bigger, and I'm like, hey, I can scale. I should probably hire somebody to teach me how to send an invoice. Um, but I got lonely. Consulting and traveling and speaking is lonely. So I had an opportunity to consult for a hospitality company here in Toronto. I moved from Vancouver to Toronto two years ago and I joined this hospitality company and here I am today. Uh, Borrow opened uh, December 7th of last year. We had to hire 100 people in 45 days and we didn't just hire anybody that had a pulse. We took them through a very rigorous interview process which I'm gonna walk you through. Um, it's probably taken like maybe three to five years off my life opening up this place, but that's okay because it was a great challenge. I can tell you opening up Borrow was way harder than any consulting engagement for any $100 billion company I've consulted for. Way harder, but more rewarding. Like I love coming in, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but I literally know everybody's name in this building that works for me, over 100 people. And that's because I don't have a crazy memory. I don't eat tuna every morning. Like it's, I just give a shit. Like I, I need to know, like they secure my livelihood, right? So like not having the audacity to not know their names, like that's just one thing. And I love coming in here saying what's up, how's your aunt doing? How was that recent trip that you took your niece to? Or whatever the case is, right? So that is some of the employee engagement stuff that I'm really good at. And I think we all need to be good at if we're gonna be admired leaders and entrepreneurs. Uh, my next challenge, um, and I'm sharing this for one of the first times, I'm actually going into the dental space um, next year. So I'm partnering up with a dentist and gonna try to recreate the dental industry. Um, my parents have no idea what the hell I do. Like they went from seeing me like working in my pajamas at their kitchen table to like, my dad's just given up. Like he just doesn't even try to pretend he knows what I do. Um, but uh, yeah, why dental? I don't know, it's like, it's a shit industry. Like who likes going to the dentist? Uh, I'm going to try to re recreate that and then, then what's the next thing? I don't know. But um, it goes back to customer experience, employee engagement and company culture. I'm going to leverage those things and I'm going to see what I can do as an entrepreneur. And it's exciting because I have no idea what the heck, like I just know that there's a lot of money in vodka and root canal. So I'm, I'm, I'm into that. So I'll go after that. Um, so that's my background. My challenges here, um, I'm, I'm very transparent with our challenges. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple. Uh, alignment. Alignment's been a challenge because uh, the restaurant industry has uh, been known in the past for the angry chef. Uh, thankfully, we do not have that. Uh, but the, you know, the Gordon Ramsay, I'm gonna yell at you and I'm gonna get you to do stuff. Like that just doesn't make sense anymore, right? Um, we had elect, you know, we parted ways with our director of operations um, because our director of operations and our general manager were butting heads, and we had to make a very hard, hard decision. Uh, and it went from you know skill and culture fit. Um, we're very protective over our culture. Um, the way that I compare it is if you spend any time vetting who's gonna come to your holiday party or your birthday party or your 50th birthday or whatever the case is, if you spend more time vetting that list than you do vetting who's coming into your business, you have a serious problem, right? Like I know some entrepreneurs that will you know, gauge whether you have a pulse and be like, you're hired. You know, like, do you like sports? I do too, you're hired. Like, um, again, I'll take you through our recruitment and our onboarding strategy. I spend 70% of my time with our management team figuring out the employee side, 30% of my time figuring out the customer side uh, because that's just the way that it has worked for me. Uh, figure out the team, they'll take care of your customers, and then you have a 20,000 foot aerial view of the operations and you refine the profits and, and, and it works. A lot of people think there's a, uh, th there's a 20% success rate in hospitality um, in the first year. We have a competitor um, there, there, and in front of us. We are literally surrounded by competitors on one of the most competitive streets in Toronto um, and, and we're doing very well. Uh, I, you know, I don't feel entirely comfortable sharing the profitability numbers, but they're good. Uh, they're very good. So if we can figure this out in one of the most volatile industries, uh, and if you feel the same way, that my industry is so competitive, it's so hard to find people, I feel you. 
right? Like those are some of the big challenges. And again, it goes back to that, you know, people, we call it the people first culture, right? This is a people first culture where it's an honest commitment made by leaders to put their employees and customers at the core of their decision making. Uh, I've taken a snapshot in these little portfolios here, in, in this little workbook, of some of the strategies that we use. We ha this is only a fraction. We actually have a total of 21 operational strategies that are happening behind the scenes that are supposed to enrich the lives of our team members and our guests. So uh, if you lose this, I know EO members like to drink, so if you lose this, um, email me and I'll just send you a soft copy. Um, anything that I mentioned today, um, if you have further questions, uh, my email address is on this document, email me, uh, happy to share, I'm fully transparent, um, anything you want to know, I'll let you know, um, and, and let's just stay connected. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to uh, bring your attention to is just uh, that people first culture in our 3P strategy. This is kind of the nucleus of our business. So this is something that you know, I, I kind of trademarked. I was looking for a slogan for what I, like it's really hard to say like customer experience, employee engagement, company culture every time. So now I just say people first culture. And then more often than not, they're like, what's that? And then I'll just follow it up with a, with a good answer. But um, we focus on our team. Our team needs to have high engagement and they're gonna take care of our customers. That's really simple. That's very easy to understand. That's no different than any other uh, Inc. Magazine article you'll read or something along those lines. But it's the three P strategy that supports the people first culture. So yes, you have your team, but do you support their purpose? I'll give you an example. Jordan Lopez is our marketing manager and he reports into me and his purpose is to use borrow as a springboard to greater success. And that does not offend me. That does not threaten me at all. He wants to start a digital marketing agency within three years. That is my responsibility to get him there as their leader. Whether that is with the company or without the company, I don't care if somebody looks me dead in the face and says, I'm gonna start a competitor and I'm gonna, I, I wanna start a restaurant, I'm gonna compete with you. I'm gonna be like, let's go, right? Like, like, allow me to invest maybe, right? Like, I'll get you there. You know, with Jordan, I've hooked him up with Dev because I know Dev's a master marketer, so how can I educate them and help him find his purpose? It is my responsibility to make sure that Jordan Lopez opens his digital marketing agency in three years. That is helping, once you get the purpose part figured out, the engagement part just happens on its own, right? That's just organically gonna happen if you hire properly and if you support them along their journey as individuals, not as employees, as professionals, as individual professionals, not just employees of yours. Once the engagement part is in place, you need the process. So I'm gonna to talk to you about something called our micro customer experience process, our complaint resolution system, which is another process. We have everything documented in playbooks because in theory, if we're gonna to scale to multiple venues, which we have the plans to, um, we need everything documented in playbooks because in theory, I want one of our dishwashers, our general managers, our bar manager to read uh, to, to look at this playbook and say, you know what, I know how to do this. Like, I know how to recruit, I know how to interview, I know how to train, right? Because if we're gonna scale, we're gonna need more able bodies to be able to help us do that. So the process has to be in place. But as entrepreneurs, more often than not, and I learned this many years ago, is that we can't just let it live inside of our head. Because what if something happens? What if we go on vacation? What if, you know, we have to step away from the business, right? It needs to be documented in playbooks. And um, I, I'm more than happy to share, I've shared our playbooks before, I'm very open to sharing those. Um, I like, to, one important thing about your playbook is don't just, like I'm not a designer, I did this last night, so pardon the lack of design, but um, our playbooks are designed. We put a fresh coat of paint on it, why? Because when it's designed with your branding, it makes it feel real, it makes it feel important. So that's why we have a, a designer that we'll work with to put a you know, fresh coat of paint on it and brand it. If we have the process in place as leaders, whether it's myself as a partner or our general manager, they can take a step back and just let the people that we've hired and trusted to do good work. Are they gonna make mistakes? 100%. Am I scared of those mistakes? As long as it's not costing me $100,000 or a big lawsuit, I'm good, right? If if an employee, and, and think about this, you probably have had this in your business where that one employee is just not getting it 
or whatever the case is, and you, you fire them. There's definitely probably, a, a, you know, there might be valid reason to let somebody go, but what I've trained my management team to do is if you are going to let somebody go, first thing you have to ask yourself is two questions. One, did our training fail them? Because our recruitment process is supposed to be ironclad. Did it, was it our training that failed them? How often did we follow up with them? Okay, if you feel like our training didn't fail them, we did everything in, in uh, like imaginable to support them, then the second question would be like, how did this person get through the interview process? We have a six step interview process. This isn't supposed to happen. Now, I know there are professional interviewers. There's some people that are really good at it and you're not gonna swing, you're not, you're not gonna bat at a thousand, right? So, but ask yourself those two questions. Don't just be so quick to fire, uh, but you know, look yourself in the mirror and be like, is it me? You know, is it our senior leadership team that's not, don't have the process right? So take a look at that and audit yourselves uh, in the business. Um, so borrow December 7th, we open. So we're coming up on one year. In one year, we've, um, on average, we're welcoming 15 to 20,000 guests per month. Uh, we'll hit eight figures in revenue in the first year. As I mentioned, 100 employees hired in 45 days before we opened. That's gonna be more with the patio opening up in Q1 of next year. Uh, how many people have millennials as a primary workforce? <laughs> so I am one. Um, we're not the easiest. <laughs> um, I have primarily millennials. Um, now, do you have to manage differently? Yeah, you do. I know some people are like, no, they're just another type of professional. Yeah, they're another type of professional that have different purposes. My purpose, when I was growing my career, was different than my father's purpose, right? So that just, it is a generation, uh, generation thing. So, you know, we have our challenges with that. Right, it's, um, you know, I'm not gonna go too deep on that because this isn't a millennial talk, but uh, we primarily have millennials as our workforce, making up the 100 or so people. 16,000 square feet, four floors. Like I said, multiple P&Ls. There's like four businesses in this building. Uh, it's, it's quite the challenge. Um, and something that I'm super happy about, and how many people actually are using Net Promoter Score? a good portion of the room. So for those not familiar, Net Promoter Score is what Apple, Facebook, American Express, and many other companies use to survey their customers. I swear by it. Uh, if anybody, you know, bad mouths NPS, I get quite offended because I've been using it for 10 years. It works. You just have to do it right. Uh, I can, you know, speak on that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but ours is seven times higher than the industry average. Um, and I'm very proud of that metric um, because it, just shows every, the heavy lifting with the team member stuff, the way we recruit, the way we interview, the way we onboard and train and in, uh, engage is working. And it's showing on our bottom line as well too. So that's it's a great measure of success for us and I'm very, very proud of it. Um, I will skip ahead to the next page. So I'm gonna jump into what are some of our employee engagement and company culture operational strategies. Every quarter we're gonna have at least two initiatives launch every three months, both on the customer and the team member side, to continuously improve our employee engagement, our company culture, and improve our customer experience. Unless you believe that consumer or empl uh, employee behaviors are never gonna change, then you do not have to continuously improve or uh, create new strategies to influence your customer experience or employee engagement. But we know that customer and employee behaviors and expectations change. So what we must get ahead of that curve and evolve with them, right? So we have to be forward thinkers. We have to continuously be building and building these strategies. Uh, next year, I'm launching uh, this webinar series. Why? Because I've, I was just asked a lot, like, what are your strategies? What are your strategies? And I said, you know what? I'm just gonna host a webinar series and I'm gonna share them. And I'm gonna give you homework so that you can continuously refine them, right? This never stops. Right, like you can never stop refining your customer experience and your employee engagement strategies. Or else if you do, you're gonna be the companies like Toys R Us on a much, you know, maybe on a smaller scale or on the, I, I don't know how big all of your businesses are, but like that's going to happen eventually, right? And I'm, I'm not a disruptor talk or a talk speaker or anything like that, but like look, look what's happening in the business climate like around us, right? These things are happening. So. Um, that's why you have to, it's exhausting. I'll tell you right now, it's, this stuff isn't easy. If it, 
You know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? So these are some of the things that you, know, you could rip off and duplicate quite easily. It's worth noting, um, I'm very cheap, uh, as in like I don't like to spend money. I like to find cost-effective ways of doing everything. And the only time I'll go to my director of finance uh, for a budget um, that we haven't forecasted for is when I absolutely need it. These are a lot of the things you can just do on your own with just some of your time. Right, maybe your personal time or you, you know, get your director of ops to do it or, or whoever in your business. So the first is our core values. Core values um, are only relevant if you're actually gonna promote them. I would tell you not to create core values, just forget about them if you're just going to you know, put them in one playbook on page three and never ever talk about them. Right? Core values are not worth your time unless you're gonna do some things like this. So what we do is it acts as our North Star. It's our guiding light in everything that we do. So our core values are stitched. You cannot run away from them. Like I'm trying to, not literally, but I'm trying to beat my employees over the head with them until they know them. I'm very confident that I could go around our building and ask every single individual, what are our core values? And they'll be able to recite them. How do we do that? You can't run away from them. So they're stitched on the, if you are ever served by somebody at Borrow, they're stitched on the inside of the apron. That's what that picture is right there. So you have to wear your apron every single time, so you're gonna see it every day. Uh, we have it printed on our paychecks. So if you wanna get paid, you're gonna see your core values each and every time. Uh, they're deckled on the bathroom mirrors of our team, in our team member room, right? So not the customer facing, just our team members. They're deckled on there uh, and we pre-shift them. Those are just four things of like 10 things that we do. So at 4.50 before service at five o'clock, our um, floor managers, our general manager will pick a core value for that evening and say, guys, ownership is what we're driving today, right? I, ownership is one of our core values. I call it own your shit, like just get it done, right? Don't point fingers. If that's your responsibility, get it done, right? Get it done on time. Uh, that's one thing that I'm very uh, strict on is really if, if this is gonna be one of your responsibilities, a KPI of yours, own it, right? If you're not able to hit it, come to us and maybe you need a better process, maybe you need a better system or support, we'll give that to you. But if we're giving and giving and giving and you're not owning your goals, we're gonna have a hard conversation and I'm not gonna tolerate goals being missed when we're giving and giving and giving. We spend a lot of money on that 10 mil, we spend a lot of money on employee engagement things. And what does that allow us to do? Obviously all the good stuff, we have high engagement, low re or high retention, high engagement, but it also gives me the opportunity to talk to one of our team members who aren't, you know, like it's an easier conversation being like, we've done everything. We've done this and this and this and this. We gotta part ways, right? And that has happened. So our core values, like think about how you leverage your core values. If you don't have any, Think about how you're gonna develop them. If you have them, how are you constantly, you have to sound like a broken record, right? Recruitment, uh, I believe internal versus external works better. Again, cost effectiveness. So if I'm looking to hire a bar manager, I'm not gonna post on a website, a job website. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send our JD, our job description that is written in a way that really attracts like-minded professionals. So hi, I hi recommend hiring a copywriter to make sure those words pop off the page because that job description is gonna be put into a whole sea of other job app uh, applications, uh, or sorry, job descriptions where applicants are gonna be looking through. Yours needs to pop off the page because it's competitive, right? We're all probably in very competitive spaces. So once we have the job description, if I'm hiring a bar manager, I'm gonna email it to every single person on my payroll and be like, think. Think of a family member, a friend, a former colleague, put someone forth. And if you know somebody, we'll incentivize you if they make it through probation. So that's the first internal tactic. Um, the second is our vendors. You don't think that the person that sells me vodka knows a, um, a bar manager? Of course they do. The person that owns, uh, sells us steak probably knows, us, knows a chef de cuisine. Again, internal. Incentivize them as well too. And then our culture video. Uh, Sean is our full-time videographer, uh, there he is. Um, he is putting the final touches on our culture video. How many minutes is it? Uh, about five, minutes. five minutes. It's me sitting in a chair talking about our culture, plus 
It's not just that. That sounds very vain. <laughs> um, plus, that was the wrong way to start. Um, plus, <laughs> plus five team members? Nine. Nine team members. Um, just talking about our culture, right? Like, what makes us great with some B-roll of, of us having fun and engaging, and then what we do with it is we purchase Facebook ads, and we splash it out, and we target the people that we're looking for, a chef to cuisine, a bar manager, a bookkeeper, right? So, like, you got to get the culture thing first before you do the culture video, uh, but uh, I'll connect you with Sean um, uh, if you're interested in seeing what that looks like. Uh, email me and I'll share it with you. I'm, I'm really, I actually don't even know what it's going to look like. I trust Sean that he's going to do a great job. But that's, again, another internal tactic. Now, if I cannot find somebody with all those efforts, then I'm going to look external. Then I'm going to tap some recruiters on the shoulders. I'm going to post on social media, buy some, uh, some ads, and um, uh, post on Indeed and, and places like that. So internal versus external. I rather pay $250 to an employee of mine who brings us a good person than paying LinkedIn. More often than not, some of our team members, uh, we, we, all, we, we will incentivize them, but sometimes they just want to work with somebody they know, right? That's a, big, a, a great enough incentive for them. Uh, more often than not, we find great, great people internally before we even have to post to the public. So, that is our recruitment strategy, uh, looking internally versus externally. I think looking externally is kind of just something we've always been taught. Uh, the internal side takes a bit of effort, like the recruitment video takes a bit of effort. You need to have a videographer, uh, but, it's, but then you have that. You can have that living on your careers page. How many people actually have a culture video? Dev, of course you do. All right, so like hopefully, you know, in six to 12 months, guys, more hands are going up. This stuff, like I, I know it's gonna work because I know it works for Dev, I know it works for Zappos, uh, and I'm you know, hedging a bet that it's gonna work for us as well too. The interview pyramid, I wanted to get here relatively quick because this is, it's exhausting talking about it. I can only imagine what it's like going through it. I actually built it in a way where I'm like, I want people to like hate me like during the process. I want them to be like, why is he making me go through this? Why? Because I'm trying to filter you out. I'm trying to make you tap and say uncle. So let me walk you through that. The phone screen, right? We all know phone screens, the value of them. I'm listening for two things. How does this person answer their phone and what does their voicemail sound like? Why? Because if they don't represent themselves well, what the hell is the likelihood that they're going to represent your brand well? I had some guy like lip me off the other day. I'm like, all right, that's all I need to know, bro. I'm good and I just didn't go forward with the phone screen. I ended it in seven seconds. Saved me seven minutes of my time just by picking up on that. Now, might I lose out on a potential good candidate because they're having a bad day? Maybe, but I'm sleeping easy at night, right? I'm, I'm okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make that bet. So the phone screen, I'm just trying to make sure that they're kind of like not a serial killer and, and not coming into our business. Just some general handful of questions, just asking them about customer experience, um, you know, what they look for in ideal colleagues, uh, what they look for in their leader. Because once I hear these answers, then I'm gonna match it. Okay, if Billy, who I'm hosting this phone screen with, is gonna report into uh, Dirk, and Billy's saying that I look for one, two, three in a leader, does Dirk have those qualities? Um, then I'm gonna say yes or no to inviting them to the culture interview. The culture interviews, in-person group interview. So four, up to four candidates on one side of the table and me uh, on the other side of the table or our GM, I don't do much hiring, actually I don't do any hiring anymore. Um, my GM and everything uh, and my assistant general managers do that, but I built the structure. Um, so multiple candidates on one side of the table, uh, one or two representatives from the company on the other side of the table. We start on the left side and ask the question, same question, same question. Then the second question starts here, so that way you're not always the first and always the last to answer. Why do we do culture in, or group interviews? The cream always rises to the top, and it's very interesting to see how people engage with strangers that they're competing with. Are they a jerk? Are they trying to sewer that person? Look, if you're competitive, there's a diplomatic way of doing it. I, I've seen some people just like, just, like immediately you know this person will fit in our culture, this person w wouldn't because they're just arrogant or like brushing off this other person. I, I, I don't tolerate that. So I have uh, 
saved myself a lot of time by doing group interviews, and I swear by them. Uh, happy to share our questions with you. Uh, again, my email address is somewhere on this document. Uh, email me, and, and I'll, I'll share those with you. Um, the culture interview, so I have not looked at the candidate's resume at this point. Why? Because I don't want to be jaded by past performance. If I see that Joey, who is applying to work for us, used to work at Jacob's, you know, a renowned restaurant across the street, I'm probably going to be enamored by that, be like, ooh, they got to be good. And that's going to, I may forget that Joey's actually an asshole. Right, like, so I'm not looking at the resume. I, I have somebody telling me their name and their telephone number. That's it. At the, uh, pardon me, at the uh, skill set interview, that is when I'm looking at their resume. Culture interview, I do not care if you know how to cook a cocktail or if you've ever cooked a steak in your life. I'm trying to figure out if you're going to fit within these five core values. We ask two questions per core value. So we're going to ask two questions related to integrity, two questions related to ownership, and so forth in the culture interview. And the only thing I'm trying to figure out is would I invite you to our Christmas party? Are you going to fit in? If not, exit them from the interview process immediately. Don't, don't, it doesn't matter where they worked. It doesn't matter. If you can, can't genuinely say, I like this person, then get them out of the interview process. Let them go ruin somebody else's culture, not yours, right? Um, Skill set interview. Now I care if you know how to make a cocktail. Now I care if you know how to code or design or whatever the case is. We ask um, a, a, about a 10 or a dozen questions during the skill set interview. Again, um, it's uh, group interviews as well too. Uh, we ask uh, in the culture and the skill set interview, we ask two questions uh, that are quite unique. What is an indulgence you can't live without that costs less than $20? So that's one question. And then in the skill set interview, we ask, what is a skill set, a non-work related skill set you want to learn in the next 12 months? I'm not going to tell you why we ask, uh, answer those until uh, the next part. But keep those questions in mind and even think, well, what's an indulgence that you can't live without that costs less than $20? What's a skill set you want to learn within the next 12 months? Salsa, learn Italian, whatever the case is. I'll come back to that point in a moment. Cool, skill set, this person's culture fit. No, they're not a serial killer. They pass the phone screen. They are a culture fit. They're going to skill set. They know how to tie their shoes. They know how to make a cocktail. They know how to code, whatever the case is. Great, I like this person. This person's probably gonna get hired. Now they get to the assignment. Do you actually know how to do the job that we are recruiting? Maybe you want them to write code. Maybe you want them to um, do some equations, write an SEO campaign, whatever the case is. Um, I send those assignments that typically take up to eight hours on Friday at 4 p.m. and I ask them to be done, sent to us by Monday at noon. Why do you think I do that? Who is willing to give up their weekend to work for us? I've had people say, not respond back, or people say, oh, actually, I have uh, this and this to do over the weekend. Look, if it's a funeral, I get that, right? If, if it's your wedding, I get that. But if you can't give up your weekend for your career, I, I don't know, like I, I'm, I'm not going to place my bet on you, I don't think. And I've, I'm thankful that that has worked for us. We have squeezed people out on the assignment just because they haven't been willing to give up their weekend. And this is for senior positions too. This isn't just for frontline employees, senior positions. And I'm actually kind of shocked. I'm like, you know, we're offering six figures and you didn't get back to us? Okay, maybe you got hired somewhere else. I don't know, but I've done this strategically and it's worked for us in the past. So that's the assignment. Let them really show their skills. Again, there's professional interviewers out there. Really hit them with a hard assignment. Maybe if you're hiring a salesperson, give them some sales objections. How would they handle them? Uh, Nikki. Nikki, how are you? Good. Nikki uh, is our venue manager. So she just started on Tuesday. Hello, Nikki. Uh, so she runs this floor. Nikki, how many hours was your assignment? Yeah. I saw it and I was like, dear God, I was like, guys, I said make this hard. Like, don't make this person bleed. Like, 
I like it, it, I saw it. It was like 20 pages. I'm like, damn, I've taught these guys well, but they're really taking this to a new level. So, um, so we started off. We received like a hundred applicants for Nikki's position, and we drilled it down and like multiple layers and layers and layers. And Nikki, I'm sorry, like I'm sorry that Colin made you do that, but you're here and you're, we're gonna be good. But um, it came down to two people. The person that didn't get it must hate us, like hate us. But it's competitive, right? We're in a competitive industry. We gotta do some things that are gonna protect our business, right? So uh, lastly is the decision and then the offer. The offer should be celebratory. Think, people are leaving their comfortable jobs. You're trying to poach them. That's a celebratory moment for them. Celebration is one of our core values. We wanna celebrate our guests and we wanna celebrate each other. So we must make this a celebration for them. Why? A number of reasons. One of which is that person you hired is gonna go back to their dining room table that night and talk to their spouse, their mother, their grandmother, their friends. And if you can make that a celebratory moment for that candidate that you just sent that offer, you're off to a great start. You're gonna increase their engagement on even before day one. You're gonna get some of their family members who help them make decisions on your side. So that's it, you gotta celebrate that decision and, and pardon me, that, uh, that offer. Cool. Uh, I, uh, if you guys have questions, I'm going to take them at the end, if that's cool. Um, so uh, let's continue forward. Onboarding is the thing that I think most companies uh, have the greatest opportunity to, to improve. Uh, I uh, define onboarding in two ways, emotional and technical. So the emotional part is because I want to increase your engagement on day one. When you come to the office, to the building, to the venue, whatever the case is. I wanna do that for a number of reasons. One, it's just good business, right? Remember people first culture, that's what I'm trying to do. But it also will increase knowledge retention. If you're engaged and you're like, whoa, this company is awesome, I love it on day one. When you go into training, you're gonna be engaged. The likelihood that your retention will go up is higher the likelihood that that individual is gonna come out of training and sell better, service better, write better code, is probably gonna go up as well too. So it's a productivity hack as well too. $20 question, Dylan, did you think of that $20 question? An indulgence you can't live without, let's try to make it legal, that it costs less than $20. Uh, just a good bottle of red wine. Great, what type, what type of grape? That's a hard one. Um, so Enzo is what I'm going to call it, and uh, I imagine it's Italian. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So that twenty dollar question, I uh, I wrote that down in the culture interview. Let's say two weeks, a month has gone by because you had to get you hired you, and you had to give your notice. A month has gone by. What do you think is waiting for you at your desk on day one when you hire when you're hired by us? It's that bottle of red wine, it's the red Skittles, it's the whatever, like we've had some funny ones um, and, and peculiar ones. Um, with a handwritten card that's branded borrow and signed by partners saying welcome Dylan, right? Uh, and, that, and then you're like, that's why you asked me that $20 question, I've been Googling what the hell the answer was and why you asked me that. I'm just, I'm just trying to engage you, man. Uh, so day one, cool. Okay, then we're off to a good start. Um, I would do peer, peer mentorship as well too. So uh, Dylan, let's say um, you, you work for a design company. I, yeah, okay. Um, so I'm gonna pair you up on day one with somebody not in your department, not your boss. So this person is going to be in a neighboring department and show you around the building, introduce you to people, take you to lunch. Why do I want it not to be your boss and somebody in a different department? because I'm trying to bridge the gap between departments on day one. How often do we not speak to that neighboring department and then you're awkwardly in your kitchen area washing your hands and you like want to say hi to the person to your right but you're like, oh, I don't know their name and this is awkward. That's, that's why you have silos in your business is because you haven't gotten ahead of that in the onboarding process. So you're gonna be assigned a mentor uh, to help you kind of break the ice. You know, it's awkward sometimes. It's kind of that first day of kindergarten all over again when you start with a new company. Remember, some of your uh, team members are actually feeling that pain on day one and that nervousness. How can you bridge that gap? So that's the emotional part amongst other things that we do here. Um, 
the technical part. Um, and of course, the second part of the pyramid there is the tools to perform, like, you know, make sure their email address is set up, make sure their fobs are set up, right? Package nicely on their desk. Don't wait to the second day. Just be, you know, that takes organization and that takes a playbook, right? A checklist for every single uh, department needs a checklist for onboarding. We live and die by checklists in this building. Uh, at least I do and I've, I've forced it down everybody's throat, uh, but it needs to be documented and it needs to be recorded. So tools to perform, just make sure everything is, uh, they're ready to go on day one, their computer set up, all that good stuff. I'm sure you guys are doing that, but just as a reminder, uh, the technical or the uh, learning and development. Yes, you want to make sure that they're trained on what they are uh, tasked to perform. Is it a sales position, is it a marketing position, whatever the case is. Um, but don't, every single department has to go through customer centric training. Whether you um, engage with customers or not, whether you're customer facing or not, you need to take every single team member through a uh, module that is titled customer centricity. I was working with Toyota when I was doing a lot of consultant, consulting, so I worked with a lot of their Western Canadian dealerships and I worked with their franchisees. And one of their franchisees, a group of them said, it does not make sense to take our technicians, the people who fix the bottom of cars, they don't talk to customers, they talk to the bottom of the car. Why does it make sense to take them through customer-centric training? And my argument was, just because they're not customer-facing uh, customer facing doesn't mean that they don't support somebody who is. If you're only going to give customer service training to, to uh, customer service people and salespeople, then you are signing yourself up for creating a divided and siloed organization. Every single person must go through your customer service training program. Now, what is your customer service training program? What should it include? It's not just please and thank you and be polite. That is what I was taught when I got my first job at McDonald's when I was 13. That's still relevant but you need to be teaching them the difference between customer service and customer experience. That's one module. You need to teach them the difference between different customer personality types. I think there's three of them. They're director style personality, the socializer, and the passive. Those are three customer personality types I developed like 10 years ago when I was answering 100 calls a day in a call center of 1-800-GOT-JUNK. I learned really quickly taking 100 calls a day that you need to speak to that elderly woman in Florida differently than you speak to the person from uh, the Quebecois individual, differently than you speak to the person from Florida, different personality types. You cannot blanket every single customer and deliver service the exact same way. Why? Because my mom expects you to talk to her about her dog and her weekend and the Vancouver Canucks. Me? You don't build rapport that way with me as the consumer. I want to be in and out. I'm a transactional guy. Yep. Yeah, it's not even working. It's not even working. Oh, there you go. Okay. No, it's still working. So I'll just keep, uh, I'll keep going. So those are the three things that go into our onboarding uh, and, and training development. It's emotional and tactical. I think most companies get their uh, tactical and technical part right, but it's the emotional thing that I think we need to be doing more of. Uh, and it's gonna be expected from your team members if you're hired incorrectly. The Employee Advisory Board. The Employee Advisory Board is a group of team members that are elected. One team member from every department sit with me and my business partner once a month for two hours, and it's off the record, closed doors, all I'm listening to is tell us the current state of our customer experience. Your managers are not in the room. Let us know, don't use names, use, you know, don't use names, don't sewer people, um, just tell us what the current state of the customer experience is and our workplace. Our employee advisory board is the best strategy we have in our business, hands down. Uh, so these elected team members are tasked with going to the, their, their peers and saying, I have my employee advisory board meeting on the 15th. Tell me what you want me to share on your behalf. So they're kind of like union representatives without the, the you know what I mean. Um, but, and it's, it gives me what I call employee intelligence. The responsibility of uh, mine and my partners is to take that feedback, the good and the not so good, and do something with it. If we're doing things well, 
I'm going to invest in those strategies more so. I'm going to double down on them. If, they're not, if there are pain points, we have to get rid of them. We start the next meeting by talking about the items that were discussed the meeting before. Why? Because it holds us accountable to actually doing stuff with what we listened the meeting before. The Employee Advisory Board is, again, can't stress enough, the best strategy, in my opinion, from an entrepreneur's perspective that we have in our business. Um, that brings us to kind of the, those were a handful of things that we have on the team member side. Our uh, retention rate is three times higher than the industry average. So this pays, right? Our time, our effort pays because we don't have to recruit that much. We don't have to train that much, right? We have high retention. And that, where does those savings go? It goes straight to your bottom line. I think, you know, it, um, for the most part, I think we're in it for a profit. Um, so these things work, right? Uh, moving on to the customer side. These are things I mentioned 70-30. Right, 70% of my time on the team member side, 30% of my time on the customer side. <laughs> Internal cues. If you starting this month and we're refining the program a little bit, if you come to borrow, you're going to be given a blue or a green menu. A blue menu means you're a returning guest. We know that you've been here before because you're in our reservation system. Thank you so much. I'm going to need that. Um, our green menu is a new guest. We do not have a record of you being here on our reservation system. We check social media. You haven't tweeted at us. We're going to assume that you're a, uh, a new customer. <coughs> that means nothing to you at all. Blue or green, doesn't matter. You have no idea that we're doing this, but they're internal signals because if you have a blue menu, Doug, I'm going to welcome you differently. Good to see you again. Welcome back. Right? And you might be like, how the hell does this guy know this? Right? <laughs> so we got to be careful, right? We have to be careful with this, but we're going to greet you like you've been here before. I'm also going to know that Doug has probably seen the menu before. So do I need to take him line item through line item? No. Do, might I guide him towards some items, perhaps, that he's ordered before? Perhaps. But that's an internal cue. Everyone will know. So. You know, Doug, you may be sitting there and I'm serving you and I'll be like, oh, welcome back. And then somebody else is going to come by like, welcome back. And like, again, we got to be careful with that because we don't want to be too creepy about it. <laughs> but it's, it's an internal cue. Uh, the, blue, the green menu uh, means that, you know, we don't have a record of you being here before, sir. Um, so that's going to tell us that we got to probably be a little slower with the menu because he's probably never seen it before, right? Uh, let's talk to them about the decor of the building, right? We have a new guest in the building. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for selecting us. We know that you have tons of opportunities. Thank you for coming to borrow. So those are some of our internal cues. I learned that from a hair salon in Cleveland, Ohio called John Roberts Spa, black or white smocks, rip off and duplicate. I read that and I was like, I'm gonna rip that off so bad. And I did <laughs> and it's working. And it, 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 it increases our engagement with our team members because it gives them a process, right? You got the engagement, uh, you have the engaged employee, give them the process to live within. Let them take care of your customers. And I'm, look, I'm laughing. Like I'm standing behind, I'm barely doing anything as an entrepreneur. I got the team firing on all cylinders and, and I've given you the process to follow, right? And then if, and if you stumble, we'll pick you up, you know, we'll train you again. But you know, blue and green menus. <coughs> Micro customer experiences. Yes, the best strategy we have when it comes to our customers. I'm going to put my name next to that one. Not because I invented it, but because it's a really, I, I think it's really good. So a micro customer experience is a small, affordable, and memorable gesture that you will do for your customers that resonates with them for years. Uh, I believe it, will, it, will, it could be any marketing, traditional marketing campaign. So what is it? Let's say, um, sorry, what's your, let's see your name. Kelly, Kelly, let's say uh, you come in, I'm serving you, you come in and by way of conversation, Kelly, I understand that you have come to borrow because you are celebrating uh, a birth in your, a pregnancy announcement. Great. Teaching your employees, this goes back to your customer service training and I want you to rem you know, replay in your head, what does our customer service training look like? And, and is everybody going through it? Um, teaching your employees to listen is not enough. Listen to your customers, listen to your customers. We've always taught them that. 
It's a cheap skill set. Listening. We have two ears. It's very easy to do that. Listen and take action on what you've heard. Kelly, I know that my customer intelligence by listening has told me that you have, uh, you're here because of a pregnancy announcement. We have a, a Laura Grant is our experience coordinator. Okay, she is responsible for creating experiences that our customers have never seen before. I'm going to run to Laura or someone at our head hostess and say, I need you to go to Shoppers Drug Mart and buy a $25 gift certificate to uh, Toys R Us because I have a guest in the building that just is, about, is celebrating a, a recent pregnancy. We have people running up and down King Street buying these <laughs> gifts. Timing is of the essence because we need to get that gift in your hands before you are done eating your dessert and you're out, right? So a, a small memorable gesture. So when we give you your bill, there's going to be a, you know, the bill, right? Um, and and um, the $25 gift certificate and a handwritten card that has a hashtag that says celebrate with borrow because we want you tweeting that stuff. We want you sending pictures. It's a part of our marketing campaign, right? What do you think on $10 million in yearly revenue, what do you think we budget a month for this program? 20,000 customers will walk through this building a month. What do you think we budget for? Thousand. Thousand. Five thousand. Two hundred and fifty dollars. Why? I'm cheap, but uh, two. If I give you a big budget, 20 G's, I'm gonna have our team members being like, balls of dom pairing on for everyone, right? Like. No, that's heating up my profit. Small and memorable, right? Tailored and customized gifts. $250. I, look, I'm, I'll be the first to admit I need to increase that budget next year because we run out of it pretty quick. Because um, our team members are engaged and they're given a process to follow. And I, I like seeing them you know, go at it and, and compete for that budget because they know they're going to run out. So I, I will increase that budget probably to about 1000 a month next year. But that's our micro customer experience budget. You don't think if we did that for Kelly that she's going to come back again, that she's going to refer. Laura Grant is going to follow up with Kelly and say, hey, how was your evening? Assuming we have your contact information via email. We're going to hope it went well. We're going to follow up and ask you for a Google review or a Facebook review. That matters in our business. I'm sure it matters in yours too. We have like our Google and Facebook reviews, we have a very high score and we have an abundance of them. You haven't earned the right for a review until you've delivered an experience your customers have never seen before. You just haven't. So if you're asking yourselves, why aren't I getting tons of reviews? Well, what are you doing to actually earn them? No, it's better to ask 10 Kellys than 100 nobodies that you haven't built rapport with. Right? So our micro customer experience budget allows us to compete in a very competitive industry. And we have a private Facebook group So whenever we uh, for the company. So whenever we have these announcements, we celebrate them, we post them, we record videos and post them on our Facebook group because it gets the team, it's rallying, we're rallying them, we're getting them to promote it and push it and it's always top of mind. Uh, net promoter score. Uh, for those uh, not familiar, you asked two questions. On a scale from 0 to 10, 10 being very likely or absolutely, how likely are you to recommend borrow to a family member or, or friend or colleague? Uh, 9 or 10 are your promoters, they're the people that love you, they're the people that you need to leverage to grow your company through referrals, repeat business, and so forth. 0 to 6 is a detractor. They're out for blood. They're the people that are going to bad, write bad reviews. 7 and 8s are passives. You could give them free everything. They're still not going to recommend you. They just sit on the fence. And that's fine. right? I consider that the passive personality type. The industry average in hospitality is 10. We're at 71. Um, really, really proud of that, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so I swear by NPS, I, I've used it for 10 years. And if you use it right, the abundance of the customer intelligence that you get from that, because the follow-up question is, in different words, why did you give us the score that you gave us? It's free form, and they're just going to tell you the good and the bad. Now, where most companies go wrong with net promoter score is that they don't celebrate team members. 
So Laura Grant, our experience coordinator, reads every single review and looks for names. Jefferson was amazing. Dirk was amazing. Kelly was amazing. You have an amazing team. We're gonna take every single one of those comments and pull Jefferson aside and say, and read the comment out to Jefferson and say, you know what, thank you for helping us grow our business. And we'll gamify it a bit too. You know, if you get five comments in a month, you get X or whatever the case is. Uh, but you guys celebrate wins with your teams. Don't, I don't recommend surveying your customers if you're just gonna hoard the data and just say, we survey our customers. Well, what do you do with it, right? What do you do with the customer intelligence to grow your business? Because the reasons you have promoters are the things that you need to be doubling down on. If your customers love you for one, two, three reason, give that data to your salespeople and your marketers. Your salespeople need to be including those three reasons in their pitches, in their sales presentations, and your marketers need to be including that language in their copy. Why? Because if your current customers love you for one, two, three reason, don't you think prospective customers are gonna be attracted to those exact same reasons? Where else do most companies go wrong? They don't create operational improvement plans. So identify the top three reasons why you have detractors. Start with the number one reason. Maybe it's you're a moving company and you're always arriving late. Create an operational strategy to make that complaint reason go away. Then go to the second one and then the third one. Don't try to do everything at once because you're not gonna succeed. It's just gonna be too much. Start with one, two, and three. We followed that strategy at 1-800-GOT-JUNK and we reduced system-wide customer complaints by 33% in three months. And when you're a company as big as they are, quarter billion dollar company, they get a lot of complaints just because they do a lot. They're not a bad company, they're a great company, they just have a lot of customers. Um, but that, what does that mean to your profitability and your reten customer retention? So create operational improvement plans. Uh, and lastly, categorize your comments. You need to be able to walk around your business and identify the top three reasons that you have promoters, the top three reasons why you have detractors, and align your entire team. You should be able to walk to your director of marketing or your director of sales or whatever the case is and be like, what were the top three reasons why we had detractors last quarter? And they should be like, boom, boom, boom. Why does that, why does that help? It's just alignment, right? You want everybody to be on the same page. If you're gonna have an aligned team without silos, it starts with how you train. It's, uh, pardon me, it starts with how you recruit. And how you train and, tr uh, and train with the customer uh, service um, content that I described. Um, look, like whether you can agree, uh, um, say yes or no to this question, we're all siloed. My business is still a little bit siloed, right? Even with all these efforts. Uh, but we gotta do something about it. We can't just sit on our hands. Like, you know, it's like there's a siren going off in our, in our business. I mean, like, we gotta do something about that. These are some of the things that you can do to make that go away. Uh, bringing it to, to the finish line here, guys, uh, our complaint resolution system. Every complaint across any channel, email, Twitter, if somebody sends a fax, sure. Um, they're gonna be resolved in one business day. How do we do that? We have a single point of accountability for our customer complaints. We set a service level agreement of one business day. It has to be resolved in one business day. At the, you know, if it's a complicated complaint, at least touch base with them in one business day, right? Whether it's via email or phone. Uh, categorize your complaint reasons as well too. You wanna know why your customers are complaining and at what percentage, you know? 33% of our complaints are X, 27% are Y, and so forth. Uh, and allocate a resolution budget. So when it comes to reimbursements, discounts, uh, micro customer experiences, that's all on our P&L. They're line items on our P&L. If you wanna take that stuff seriously, put it on your P&L. Allocate a budget for it because you're gonna see it every single month. It's a great reminder of how important this is gonna be. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, those are, you know, as I'm reading this, I'm like, wow, you know, we're doing a lot of stuff. And in retrospect, <coughs> we have, or more, moreover, we have 21 operational strategies running behind the scenes um, uh, on top of the ones that I just uh, explained. In retrospect, would I have done all of this in year one? Hell no. I've, I've taken a couple years off my life. Start small couple strategies, a few strategies a year, two strategies a quarter, right? I, I overdid it. I, I stand before you and tell you that you don't need to do all this stuff in one year. 
Um, but you got to start somewhere. Start with the thing that you know you can influence. Maybe you do have a number two in command. Get them. You know, I, again, I told you about my webinars. I'm, the first one is happening November 29th. It's free. I promise your number two or somebody you believe in in your business will value from that webinar. I love talking about this stuff, guys. Um, more than happy to answer any questions now, in a week, in a year. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Before we go Q&A, thank you so much for your attention.